uh, I would like to introduce uh, our next uh, two panelists, in fact. Uh, so uh, first, uh, Professor Margit uh, Busman. Uh, she, is, uh, um, she is a professor uh, uh, at the Chair of International uh, Relations and Regional Studies at the University of Greifswald in Germany, our partner university also in this uh, larger project uh, in Perreg. Um, she uh, did her habilitation thesis, well, uh, after the second book, so called, as we say in the American, uh, as it said in the American context, rather in the Anglo-Saxon context, at the University of Constance. And first, uh, she had um, a curriculum that was more uh, American, in fact, as uh, her uh, MA and her PhD uh, were at the University of Alabama in, in the United States. Um, uh, she is currently focusing her research on security and cooperation in the Baltic Sea region. And uh, she will present uh, uh, the paper together with uh, her uh, PhD student, uh, Mrs. Uh, Natalia Iost, who is uh, a researcher at the Department of Political and Communication Science at the University of Greifswald. And she focuses on Russian foreign policy and soft power tools. Uh, I don't know how you have planned it, uh, who starts or if uh, you, you split the presentation in two parts. It's up to you, you choose it. Uh, you can also share your, uh, your screen. So I would say that uh, we can start. So 20 to 30 minutes uh, for your presentation. All right. Oh, we can't hear you. We can't hear you. No, no, no. We see you. We see your presentation. Everything's okay. Just the sound. Now it should be working. Now it's okay. Okay, okay. very good. Thank I you very much on. for the introduction. Yeah, we will split up the presentation. I will guide you a little bit through the first. Um, part of the presentation where I will set a bit the frame on the, on the um, theoretical foundations mostly and then uh, Natalia will present you with uh, the results of our findings. And um, maybe just, um, just briefly here the, the focus of our uh, of our paper is here now at the Baltic Sea region in the last 20 years or so. And as you probably, I don't have to say too much in the introduction, but I think we all have here sort of um, the motivation for that we live in a region that is a relatively peaceful maritime region. Not all of you might think so, but if we compare to many other uh, maritime regions, um, you could say that it's a, it has a long history, not only of conflict, but also long history of active commercial and cultural exchange. Uh, it has, it's now strongly integrated in economic and political terms. Um, it, all countries are member of the European Union with the exception of Russia. So there's then many different levels cooperation. But at the same time, we share a sense of um, some of us maybe stronger than others, but there is a sense of um, insecurity. There is coming to the conference theme, there is fear, um, especially the region is known as this hotspot of uh, tensions for most of the 20th century. And there has been like the superpower competition. We talked about that throughout the conference now in several ways. Um, and now uh, we have now Russia as a dominant regional power and we have a very different threat perception. I think for especially for the Baltic states, but also for Poland, there is one of the top foreign policy priorities of fears is, um, is uh, related to Russia. And in turn, Russia feels of course, threatened by the presence of NATO and NATO's eastward expansion. So here we have uh, also occasionally media reports on um, on Russian Russian planes entering um, 
entering um, airspace, having airspace violations. As here, one example, the, the event in 2018 when, when Putin's plane was on his way to a summit in Finland and when they flew without clearance uh, over the island in the Estonian island of Weindloom. And here the New York Times asks this question uh, whether there is this whether it has been the hotspot in the aerial game of chicken between Russia and NATO, or the, whether it was just to take a shortcut over this island. And that's basically also our research <clears throat> interest. We want to discuss whether um, militarized disputes and border violations in the Baltic Sea region, whether they are something that occurs by accident or whether there is a sort of a systematic pattern. And in particular, we want to focus then on whether Russia uses minor military incidents of this type of smaller border violations to signal its resolve and to deter further NATO expansion. And that's where I uh, just briefly want to give some background, but I think the audience is sufficiently well familiar with the situation that I don't need to go very much into detail. But we have here in the period that we cover, we have a time where there was after the end of the Cold War, quite a, a while there was um, something what some scholars refer to as a honeymoon period, where there was uh, the, the region's security architecture was still rather uncertain. There was, however, though, um, more the motivation to go on cooperation with Russia. There was movement in towards a strategic partnership. We had in 1997, the NATO Russia um, founding act that was signed that enhanced then the, the cooperation further and also uh, gave ground to NATO expansion. Then later, you all know about the NATO enlargement then to Poland and then later to the Baltic states. And I think for us, what's also maybe then later important is also um, that there were talks then in 2008 about a possible uh, extension of NATO to include Georgia and Ukraine. And that's when we also observed then the Georgian Russian war and later then, of course, 2014, the Ukraine crisis annexation of uh, Crimea. So those are. Uh, important um, steps in our in our timeline that you probably want to keep in mind. But what I want to do now is first talk about the theoretical um, background. And uh, since since we are political scientists, we always need to sort of uh, rely strongly on theory. And here we rely on a theory that Professor Weber, in his introductory remarks. Um, yesterday, or the day before yesterday, um, you already referred a lot to um, to these questions of the security dilemma, to realist school of thought, etc. And that's what we rely on as well. We rely here in our arguments on the on the, um, on the classical deterrence theory has been a, oh, sorry, too fast, that has been a type of theory that has been really very prominent during the Cold War and yeah, we thought yeah, for a while, and we, we thought for a while that it's, uh, that is something that really historians will deal with, but it became prominent again. So I think there is a, a microphone to be switched off, please. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Ktoś musiałby tam wyłączyć e, mikrofon, poproszę. Nic się nie stało, tylko żeby nie był zakłóceń. Dziękuję uprzejmie. Thank you so much. Okay. So in this uh, this uh, this uh, deterrence theory strongly is of course built on this element of fear and with a it has been really the focus when we when we explained relations between Soviet Union and the US and the, the two blocks uh, during the Cold War and the policy of deterrence um, relies on a threat of military retaliation with the intent to prevent the opponent from using or threatening to use force in the first place. So this is the idea uh, and in, so the question that is important is how how are threats um, coming across? How are they uh, put forward? And for a 
threat to retaliate can only be based on a threat then to impose um, punishment or to deny the opponent relative gains. And it can only work if such a threat and deterrence in general uh, if it is a convincing threat. And for it to be convincing, it has to be, you need to have the military capabilities to push through with the threat, but you also need to show as a leader or as a country then the willingness to use the resources you have to the extent that is then necessary. So we have here the, the, the typical application has as you see here on the slides uh, on, the, on the arms competition during the Cold War. And those of you a little older or familiar with that, you know about all those concepts of second strike capabilities, uh, the counting of warheads and all that what we experienced over the Cold War period. There is a, this is there's another vari variant. Uh, there's a structural type of deterrence theory, but there's also a game theoretic deterrence theory that's based in more on the decision making, which relies a lot on this argument of the chicken game. Um, that I won't go into it now. I might, if there's time or if there's interest, I can talk about it later. But it's the idea, as you saw in the James Dean movie that basically um, two drivers drive towards each other. And it's a very prominent application then to the Cuban Missile Crisis, for example, and this concept of brinkmanship, push dangerous events to the brink to get concessions then from somebody else. So one, we won't go into all of the deterrence theory, but one central challenge that deterrence um, theory it has to deal with is this question of what makes a threat credible. Foreign policy and international crisis in general are situations where you have high levels of uncertainty. There's a lot of private information. We often know very little or not quite that much about the military strength and especially then the resolve to use force. Besides, you have plenty of incentives to misrepresent. So all this makes it quite difficult then to find a negotiated solution. So one central challenge is then to determine whether a, a threat is credible or um, whether it's just a, a bluff, whether it's cheap talk. So how can we distinguish what when is the threat to be taken serious and when was it just a cheap talk? So that's something um, that we deal with in our field quite a lot and there are various ways to to I, to make um, threats credible for one thing you can rely look at the military balance and capabilities and maybe especially for historians interesting is past behavior and what are the reputation that um, country leader develops for example uh, how how did the country leader in the past show um, commitment to alliances etc and you can also and that's what we want to focus on in our argument focus on the signaling in a bargaining context and essentially uh, you can make an announcement of a foreign policy more credible if you attach costs to it so if it's a costly if it's a costly signal, presumably it will be taken more, more seriously. Again, looking a little bit at time, um, just briefly, how can you attach costs to a signal? Uh, you can attach costs exposed by tying your hands. Uh, this is often related to as domestic audience costs. For example, a leader might lose re-election if um, he or she handles a, a crisis unsuccessfully. But there are also sunk costs um, that occur ex ante. These are typically financial costs, uh, such as troop mobilizations, uh, small scale conflicts. We talked in the past about military maneuvers could be some, some type of sunk costs, where costs occur regardless then of how the opponent reacts. And also smaller military militarized incidents, not large scale wars, could be by some um, or are considered by some as part of a bargaining process. So here that's what uh, 
what we expect here that some of those small scale militarized incidents and minor border violations that we might observe um, in the Baltic Sea region could possibly be costly signals that the Russians send out um, that send out to show that they are resolved that they are resolved to use force and with the idea behind is then to deter further NATO expansion. So here are our theoretical expectation uh, that uh, the question is whether Russia uses minor military incidents to signal resolve and to deter NATO expansion. And here we would, based on this argument, what we would expect is to see more airspace violations over the Baltic Sea before the various NATO enlargement rounds. And I think at that point, I hope I didn't use up too much time. I try to be quick, happy to answer questions later and we'll pass on to Natalia now. Natalia, I will Great. stop. Thank you so much. It, we, are, we are okay with time, so. I think we should be okay. I stop here and hand over to Natalia. Um, thank you very much. I just project my screen to... So. Can you see it? Yes, okay. we can. You can put it on the full screen if you want. I'm trying, but uh, it doesn't work. Oh, okay, here. Mm. Yes. No. Good. Uh, so, at the final, with uh, the research design and what we have done, uh, we have systematically collected data uh, on the reports uh, of on border violations in Baltic News Service from 1995 till 2018. And Baltic News Service is probably one of the most well-known uh, news agencies in the region. Uh, here you can see our keywords. We searched uh, for all uh, member states of the Baltic Sea regions, and we also searched for different types of violations, AAC, travel, uh, uh, pardon, naval, border, and land violations. We ended up with a total of 50 events, this military component. What we have done and in the next uh, step, we cross-checked our data um, against uh, the uh, broadly used data on um, military conflicts and military inc inc incidents of correlates of war from 1992 until 2010. And, and the interesting thing that the correlates of war uh, in this time period have only has only five incidents uh, in the Baltic Sea region. Uh, and the difference uh, that uh, the correlates of war, they work with uh, the international news agencies, such uh, like BBC, for example. And uh, it was a very, <laughs> I think it was a good decision of us to take the regional uh, news uh, service, the Baltic uh, uh, news wire. So uh, these are our results uh, the from the 50 events, uh, most of the uh, disputes are airspace violations, uh, 48 uh, airspace violations, you can see them in this um, table from 58 violations in 45 cases, Russia was a violator. Most of the incidents took place between uh, Russia and Estonia uh, following um, uh, incidents between Russia and Lithuania, we haven't found any single case uh, uh, which took place between Russia and Latvia. And it was very interesting because we presented this data at some conferences all, all, all also in Tartu. And the first reaction was a big surprise because um, it was evaded much more. And uh, the thing is uh, that uh, well, the trick is in all this thing that the media, they usually report also about the incidents when the planes just fly near the border, but don't cross the border. But in all in this incidents, the uh, NATO jets scramble, and this is also uh, something what media are reporting about. Uh, we, for our data, we took only uh, the incidents uh, where there was a fact of violation, uh, where the plane crossed the border for 10 or 20 seconds. There's always, you can say, you can read it from the reports, uh, most of the violations, uh, so about 10 and 20 seconds. And uh, because, uh, we also have a colleague from Latvia, he was also uh, a bit skeptical at the beginning, but he helped us a lot because he cross-checked our data 
for Latvian Latvian language, and he also didn't found didn't find uh, any single case uh, for Latvia. But what he has found, uh, I will show you. This is uh, this site from Latvian ambassador to NATO uh, into this. Bashins, I hope I said it correctly, who said uh, 2015, he said the following uh, remark, while uh, identified Russian airplane maneuvers near our airspace are dangerous and unfriendly, Russia has never, not once, entered the Latvian airspace. So this is a pretty good confirmation for our data so that we are also uh, confident with uh, our results. The next interesting thing is that from this uh, 35 uh, violations which took place uh, between Russia and Estonia, 25 um, uh, took place near this Vindlow Island. Uh, and you can see on this map uh, that uh, the Russian planes, they usually start from St. Petersburg or Kaliningrad, and then they go for this very narrow part of the Gulf of Finland. And uh, here in this Gulf of Finland, you can see the Vindlow, this long island. Uh, the trick is a little bit that um, the Russian uh, place might uh, make a kind of shortcut here. And the Van Law is actually a very high um, contested spot and politically contested because uh, the uh, Estonian part usually says that Russia uh, violated uh, our uh, airspace, various Russia um, says that there is uh, denies of this, um, uh, the, the, the facts of violations. And uh, the problem, uh, the problem that lays here. Um, ah, okay, I'll show you the next set from Mark, uh, Marco Michelson. Uh, he, uh, he is a deputy. Uh, he was a deputy of the parliament and also chairman of Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, he, 2005, he said uh, that uh, this uh, contemporary navigation equipment. It's absolutely unthinkable that these entries are accidental acts of uh, ne negligence. And the same uh, politics 2013, he said uh, about the bind law problem that the bind law is not that is a, a preferred destination for airspace violations, but the area is a relic of the Soviet times where Russian air traffic control overlaps with Estonian airspace. So these are also controversial uh, opinions um, among the Estonian officials and um, uh, you can see on this example of Michelson. And the thing is, uh, he talking here about that there is still a problem in uh, the elimination of the border, of sea border, but also the border in the airspace between uh, Russia and Estonia, so that the both sides can uh, interpret uh, this differently. So, uh, <clears throat> These are our results. Uh, as uh, we said, most of the violations, they took place between Russia, Lithuania, and Estonia. And here you can see the distributions, the most high drink activities took place uh, around 2004 and around 2014. I will show you the other uh, uh, graphic uh, kind of temporal pattern where you can also see uh, here are some events which took place around that time. And when I go back to our research uh, questions, if this militarized disputes and border violation in the Baltic Sea region occur by accident, or is there is a systematic pattern, we can see here uh, pretty sure that uh, there is uh, there is probably there are some accidental cases, but uh, there is not a, a accident because if there was an accident, that we would have a more random distribution of uh, the uh, violations, and we do have most of them uh, after 2004. This was the time period of NATO enlargement to the Baltic states to the Russian borders, and the next period, 2014. Now the uh, attempt of the Ukraine to integrate into the European uh, Union and uh, the uh, NATO. And then when we think on the second question, does Russia use minor military incidents to signal its resolve and to deter for the NATO expansions? There's always uh, probably more no, this is uh, not uh, evident from our data. There are some uh, accidents that took place, for example, before the uh, first NATO investment round. Uh, but uh, what we see here, we see more this action-reaction pattern that uh, Russia reacts on certain um, 
political uh, processes which take place. And uh, what should I say, uh, say also about this results? Uh, 2004, it was probably not only uh, the reason of NATO engagement, because 2004, uh, there uh, was a start of the air policing commission uh, in the Baltic states so that um, uh, the Baltic states and NATO, they started to invest more attention to these uh, incidents, uh, like airspace violations. And in 2014, they were uh, all in all uh, high rank military presence in the region. For example, uh, the military exercises, the first military exercises of China and Russia in the Baltic Sea, and um, all these things uh, which... Um, which uh, could also be a reason of this heightening activities. So I'll just summarize for all our findings of what we have seen from this uh, temple pattern. There were only some individual airspace violations pre to NATO engagements and more incidents took place actually after accession of Baltic states. Uh, interestingly, there were no hydric activities in Baltic Sea region around the Georgian war and NATO's consideration of expansion to Georgia and Ukraine, which was around 2008. Um, a strong increase uh, in violations uh, we can observe after the Ukraine crisis and the annexation of Crimea 2014. So that I repeat probably one more time that uh, what we see is more uh, in the logic of action reaction uh, than in the uh, diversionary uh, uh, logic of deterrence. So this is uh, uh, the summary of the fighting. Thank you very much. And we will be glad to answer your questions. Thank you so much. Thank you for your uh, presentation uh, to both of you, to Professor Busman and, and to you, uh, Mrs. Yost. So uh, I'm sure there will be some uh, themes for discussion. Uh, in fact, also um, because of the, 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 the proximity of the subject and the, the Russian moment uh, we had before uh, during our, mm, our session today. And, and also, in fact, uh, from a historical point of view, mm, uh, yesterday. Uh, well, so first, I uh, just have a look at the chat window. So far, there are no questions, but they could appear. And I see that uh, among our panelists, we have two uh, persons who would like to uh, ask something. First, Dr. Singh, and then Dr. Nitu. So uh, Akansha, it's your turn. Uh, am I audible? Okay, okay, okay. Oh, thank you so much. And I really found your uh, topic very interesting. And especially uh, to know that there has not been any airspace violation between Russia and Latvia, which was very surprising. Uh, so I was just thinking if uh, any one of you could kind of comment on the vulnerability of these Baltic states, especially Baltic states, especially related to the uh, Russian military attacks and also if uh, you could you know kind of just uh, emphasize a little bit more on the inland violations not the airspace uh, if it is any of it is there and uh, if it is there then uh, just how many and uh, whether they have included Latvia because Latvia and Russia it you know, it is. It comes uh, across as an interesting point because uh, Latvia has got more Russian people, and Latvia has been having more issues uh, with Russia related to Russian minority and maybe with the security aspect also. So it is uh, kind of a nice fact that uh, they do not have any airspace violation. Thank you so much, and I hope my question is. Should I, Natalia, maybe? Um, so, yeah, thank you very much. I mean, really, I mean, uh, Natalia already mentioned that we, we have to keep in mind that we really look at actual violations. So, um, like, there are many other ways how Russia um, mingles with the countries, and that's what Natalia works on in her dissertation, then on soft power issues. So what we really focused in as an actual border violation. And this we 
in the Baltic states. And this, we did only find one case, actually. I mean, we really found the large majority because we looked for all of it. And we found the large majority, really the airspace violations uh, and one violation at sea and one violation at land. And I don't remember exactly. I think the land violation had to do um, then with um, somehow pursuing some I mean, the, the, the seal violation had to, uh, like Russians followed then some fishermen that violated their airspace. So it was not like a big, uh, not like a really big, um, uh, big thing. And I think that's also the thing that uh, maybe uh, that you have to keep in mind also the, from all the violations that we saw, there were some that were more serious than others, of course, um, and some where you, had like um, like but very individual cases only where you had um, before the 2004 NATO expansions a violation then a few months before of 20 minutes where a Russian plane came 20 minutes into um, Estonian airspace uh, but in most other cases it was very short like a minute or so and in most other in most cases by far most cases. It's not this what we consider dangerous action. It's more like a semi-routine type of things because the Russian planes had their transponders on. They had their, um, they, they usually provide documentation ahead of time. Uh, so they had their, their documentation provided. They responded to radio contact, etc. Did that answer your question? Thank you. Thank you so much. So we have four uh, more questions or comments. Uh, I mean, uh, three more. We had two plus three. So now uh, Dr. Nitu, then we have Professor Suhopless, Dr. Mijinsky, and Professor Hackman. So uh, Dr. Nitu, it's your turn. Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, I have a short comment and then a question, if I may. Uh, um, under the Organization for Security and Cooperation in, in Europe, which is the successor of the Helsinki process, uh, in 1992, it was signed the Treaty on Open Sky that established a regime of unarmed observation flights over the territories of the member states. Uh, and this regime specified, for example, quotas for observation flights or notification of the entry points and so on and so forth. Uh, and as far as I know, uh, this regime uh, have come under pressure recently when Russia threatened to leave the agreement. So this is my question. So it's not clear for me, and perhaps you have more info, if Russia formally left the agreement or only threatened to leave it. Uh, however, from its declaratory suspension of the implementation of the treaty, uh, I, I uh, draw the conclusion the situation is, is stands today. Um, it's a good question, actually. I have to admit that <laughs> came after we wrote the paper and I, I followed it in the news and there was, I, I didn't follow then if finally Russia left or not. This, I, I have to admit, I'm not, not fully sure. It has been a very helpful, this Open Sky um, Agreement, but it was, um, I mean, I think it was uh, discussed like a few months ago that it was... Uh, Russia was uh, discussing of leaving, but also, I mean, also the US, but, but no, I have to admit, don't know if, if, if eventually now it left or not. But there are, uh, I mean, there, there is an up and down and um, in terms of, um, of uh, these, these agreements that are very helpful and maybe just going into a different, because I'm currently, um, we're working on a, on a, on a study where we want to look more closely at military maneuvers. And there also you have like sometimes not those very fully clear cut type of situations because you found, I mean, after, after Ukraine crisis and Crimea, it's all different. But until then you had 
um, there, we had even in times of the Georgian war, there was only a suspension of a military maneuver, but then they cooperated in other areas um, as well. And I think with the open skies, it's um, not sure, could be something along those lines. Okay, thank you. Or maybe it's oh. a moving in the play, probably. Mm -hmm. I mean, there has been like one of our um, cases where there was a violation did occur also with a, an international observer under the open sky agreement in the plane. So, you know, so this is just to give you an example that there's, it's one of other example um, where an international observer was in the plane and they violated, um, which speaks probably also a little bit more at, uh, at not the big dangerous, type of um, provocation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you to both of you. Uh, our next uh, panelist with a question or a comment, Professor Sucho Pless, uh, please. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much, first of all, for your very interesting uh, presentation topic and, and research in broader sense. And I have, in fact, only one uh, short question. Do you make, because, you know, in this Baltic area, Russia uh, possesses uh, five neighbors. I mean, five neighbors uh, of different status, uh, by the way. Uh, but when we look closer at the, at the map, in fact, uh, the situation in the Gulf of Finland is the most uh problematic so to say if from the point of view of uh, uh incidents border incidents and i would like to ask whether you uh, make any comparative study as a kind of uh, reference point for you regarding how many and what was the nature of incidents uh involving estonia and latvia and these other three countries um, yeah, or actually, so this, is, a, this, this is my question. Yeah, N Natalia, can I, I just start and you, you add a little, I mean, we have to say originally we wanted to do the whole of the Baltic Sea region, you know, all, all literal states, that was our <laughs> original plan, um, but then we, we, we concentrated on the Baltic states because mostly we, we took as a source the Baltic News Service um, um, as a source and that's been I mean that's just we decided we figured oh if there is a violation then it will be reported by the Baltic news service because the Baltic states are very very um, keen on uh, on that topic we thought so but then we realized um, that it that's really actually it was biasing towards the Baltic states because I'm sure there were events with Poland or with, uh, with I mean we, we compared to other other sources and actually one source um, that went undetected, um, one source that went undetected was, uh, was um, one incident involving Sweden. So that was one where, that we didn't get in our data collection when we compared to, to some other source. But I think it would be a different picture if we were, for example, to look at the at the, at the Polish sources, because there is in one of our articles, there was a reference when it came to this incident um, that was a little bit more fitting our theoretical expectation. There was this incident in Estonia before the accession of, um, of the Baltic states to NATO. There was in the report then a quote by, um, by a Polish um, uh, naval officer uh, not naval um, air force officer uh, who said that similar and a similar event happened before 1999 and polish accession so that there was something but that's not something that we could code you know because we needed specific time i mean we could code only events that were uh, specific in time a specific event and um, that was reported because there were if there were general remarks with regard to in the past there were also violations such and such that's not something we could really take in so there's this bias towards the the baltic states so in fact it is possible to say that your there is 
some kind of a research problem for you, the limitation of sources? Um, I mean, it's just, we, we could go further, of course, but uh, I mean, but it's just a question of resources and time. Mm. I mean, it took, took a lot of time and um, our financial resources, resources to hire coders or so are, are limited in this regard. But I think still, this is really a most crucial area, as you see, this Gulf of Finland is the most uh, crucial area. And we, uh, I don't have the, I, I mean, from reading all about it in the literature, I didn't have the impression that we, that we would find much, much more if we were to open up for, I mean, Poland would be interesting, of course, this, um, because also of the NATO expansion, but if we take the other literal states, um, like Denmark, Sweden, um, it probably is not going to, to bring that many more mm. events. But the only other one where I think would be really also worth looking closer a little because we read about general reference towards, um, towards Finland. Finland would be something to look more Oh, into. yeah. Oh, yes. I only can say so. Oh, yeah. Yes. Okay. But I mean, for us, nice. we make our conclusions basically we limit it for the Baltic states. That's like in the, in the paper, we just uh, focus on that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the next question by uh, Dr. Paweł Miedziński. Uh, you can ask your question in English, uh, albo po polsku. Uh, I'll try in English. It's a rare occasion for me, uh, opportunity for me to, to practice this language. Um, uh, I have two questions. Um, Baltic states are uh, don't have armies, big armies, of course. They don't have uh, air forces at all. I mean, interceptors and, and military aircraft. Um, so NATO forces um, is uh, providing Baltic air policy. And my question is, do you think that uh, NATO is able to um, shut down Russian military plane, of course, uh, in the situation of um, longer violation, not 10 seconds maybe, but, but uh, of course, much important violation uh, of a Russian uh, plane, like uh, Turkish Air Force did it in 1915, I, I suppose. They, they shot down Russian plane uh, very quickly. And uh, they still are friends, I think so. Uh, I'm not sure if NATO is ready to use real force uh, against Russia. And um, second question, maybe the answer why uh, Latvian uh, airspace wasn't violated at the uh, time is uh, that uh, there are no airbase in Latvia. There are in Estonia and in Latvia, in Litva, Lithuania. And uh, maybe Russians show there are no bases, no violations. You will build base, we will violate airspace. And that's all. Thank you. Yeah, this is a very important point that you make, uh, the, the air policing uh, of NATO, that uh, where you mentioned the, the two, the, the, they are based in, um, in Siauli and in any case, in Estonia and um, in Lithuania, and um, and this is in, this is of course important aspects. Uh, I mean, on the geography, you see, you see it um, in that um, in that sense. Now, the question whether um, I mean the the idea, of course, of this air policing would be also to deter. I mean, so the, if deterrence works, then you wouldn't expect exactly that Russia would shoot down a NATO plane. And I think the, the, the air policing missions of NATO, they originally started out with, um, I think, with four jets that they stationed there. And then after Ukraine, they went up to, I don't know, eight or 16 even, I mean, or with Georgia, they went up, they continued to go up shortly after they went a little bit down again. Um, so the idea would be, of course, that there isn't such an incident. Now, whether, I mean, if there is a very serious incident, then probably NATO 
I would suspect uh, nature would react if there are smaller incidents, but they usually do you very often have nature jets um, scrambling then. So where they, they scramble, I mean, this you have all the time, even many more reports on nature jets scrambling, not with the border violations. I mean, they do, but also if there is just a Russian plane coming close to a border to the airspace border. Um, so then you have NATO jets uh, scrambling going up. They partly use that also as, um, as so-called alpha scrambles where they, where they practice um, a little in, in real life. I mean, I think, so NATO is, is present, is, um, is active there. And I think one other new concept that NATO um, which is, I think, quite interesting concept. Not in the, and we didn't focus on that, of course. There's a Andres Banka, um, a postdoctoral student in Greifswald. He will uh, he will start studying that. Is the enhanced forward presence, and here the idea is a different type of deterrence con concept. I think, in the sense that NATO deployed um, these multinational battalions in the in the Baltic states. So the idea would be then if Russia attacks one of these, then it would attack not just one country, but several countries, because they are multinational in nature, and that would um, certainly trigger a reaction. So the idea. Now, whether they will eventually or not, this is hard to tell. I'd like to add something because uh, also to a policy commission, they actually raised uh, these NATO jets uh, during the Ukraine crisis to 16, but they reduced them next year after back to four because they were not really needed. They were not that much activities then, uh, back then. And uh, probably one of the explanations with, La with Latvia is also the geographical um, uh, because we have seen that most of the violations they took place in the scaffold field in this uh, contested territories and uh, Latvia probably is not such a hot geographical spot in this sense. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, I think, uh, Pavel, uh, it's an answer to your question. You, you're satisfied? Panie doktorze. Tak, dziękuję bardzo. Dobrze. Uh, and the last question I can see from our panelists is a question or comment by Professor uh, Jörg Hackmann. Then I would have one comment if we have time enough. I think I can make it. Yeah, uh, so uh, thank you very much for this interesting presentation. Actually, I have one comment and one question. Um, which goes a little bit beyond, let's say, your, your um, research um, scope. So first, uh, the comment um, uh, referring to the discussion uh, of your sources and your regional focus. So it might be then, or this would be a question, it might be then useful to uh, signal rather that you're focusing on the Baltic states and not on the Baltic Sea region, because otherwise then uh, one might ex um, expect what uh, Yaroslav Suroplas uh, uh, suggested also to include other parts of the uh, region, so Finland, maybe also uh, Sweden, also uh, not a NATO member. So this would be the first uh, comment. And the second question, um, so if we look at, let's say, the fields uh, of uh, conflict, there is, at least from the Estonian perspective, uh, one beyond uh, these airspace violations, uh, which is, uh, let's say, uh, cyber uh, attacks. And this is uh, closely connected to the, or uh, um, appeared uh, after the so-called uh, Prom Soldier crisis in 2007. And as far as I know, so uh, NATO is quite alert uh, on this issue and also has uh, at least, I'm not sure whether an institution, but at least a couple of officers uh, in Estonia uh, dealing with uh, cyber attacks. So my question would be, how does uh, these, uh, this focus on cyber attacks relate to your focus on air violations? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, maybe just quickly, I, I do want to point out that we, we, we do, we do I think we do more than just the three Baltic states, not that I, I mean, in the paper, we also write about that there might be a bias, but we did code 
um, I mean, we so we searched for violations in Finland and so on too, but in this one specific source. But I still would expect if there were a very serious violation in Finnish airspace or Polish airspace, I would strongly expect that that would have been reported in the Baltic News Service. So I do, I'm still want to defend a little bit our data collection. It's not that we only do the three Baltic states. There might be a, a bias towards reporting more very minor incidents in the Baltic states that might go unreported, that might have occurred in Poland or Finland, this one minute type of violations, but that didn't make it to international news then, obviously. So I think that just to 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 defend a little bit, not only the Baltic, I mean that we do more than just the Baltic states. Um, but now with the cyber attack, I mean that's a very very good um, good aspect. We just don't do it in our paper. I mean I think it's very valid. It's very important. Um, it's uh, you mentioned Estonia 2007, um, and this this I think some, Natalia writes in the in the in the chat that this led to this establishment, I think, of the Cooperative Cyber Defense Center of Excellence in Tallinn. So there is, NATO is active there, but that's just, we cannot do everything in the paper. So our focus is really on these types of airspace violations. But cybersecurity is very much a topic, of course. I mean, and we could go in length of, uh, I mean, discussing on, on also whether, um, these different types of, um, of what you often find under this term of hybrid warfare, whether this becomes more prominent than the purely military aspect, because in military terms, I mean, that's something that we saw after the, the, the Georgian war, Georgian-Russian war in 2008, that in this time period, the, 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 the Russian military needed modernization, which it underwent in the meantime. But but good point. Thank you. Thank you too. Um, uh, I don't want to, to open an additional front line, but I was thinking for myself that, of course, we're speaking about uh, the um, air uh, zone violations. But as we're speaking about uh, the Baltic Sea region, uh, going from the heights of the air territory to the depth of the Baltic Sea, there are also uh, this kind of problems, especially with regard more to Sweden, of course. Uh, and my question would be, uh, are you uh, uh, making some research on this too? Or do you know some research about this uh, field? Well, uh, uh, under the sea level, in fact, with the submarines, you know, this uh, story is uh, that the one submarine was pretty close to the Swedish coastline uh, a couple of years ago. And so it would be my question in case you have some something to add to, to this and to go back to our sea, in fact. Yeah, I mean, as, um, we did search for air, land and sea violations uh, and only one land violation of actual territorial type of violations, border violations, only one C came up. Now this um, submarine in, in Sweden, that's a very good question. We just, I have no idea. I mean, we looked into that. Um, there are reports about the submarine, but then there are reports about uh, whatever it is. Nobody knows exactly whether it was a submarine or not. Um, so it's just, we, we, we didn't fully search. I mean, I didn't go into very much detail, but I had my antennas um, uh, stretched out always um, whenever I came across something. And I think that's just the, I mean, for the moment, not clear what it was. So that it, it's not, it didn't show up in our, um, in our, in our data in some, in some way. Um, of course, the, and then I think talking also to Swedish colleagues, uh, they also say like, it seems unclear what it is exactly. But yeah, I mean, this would be, uh, I'm not aware of, um, I mean, we didn't study it further, but this would be of course something that could be highly interesting to look at uh, all together at the, the submarine, um, the submarine type of uh, activities, because there is certainly 
certainly a lot. No, but I, we, we haven't done it and we, I don't at the moment have any projects um, in mind. Well, it was know. just a reflection of mine. In fact, yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's interesting because yeah, you you would think especially, um, especially uh, the the sea area there. No, I think what uh, what uh, the the airspace violations also were related. I think to um, to heightened activities around that time when the when there were the crisis, and we also saw some reports, and that's something we want to look a little bit into in the future also some violations that are related at times of the large maneuvers that were going on. You know, you have, um, and we're currently uh, working on that a little to collect a bit more systematic data on NATO and Russian maneuvers. I mean, Russian maneuvers in the Western military district and NATO maneuvers in the Baltic Sea region. And in this um, context, you have some, there, there probably the topic will come up, I think a little because you have, uh, maneuvers that are in the region then very often land and sea based then okay thank you yes in fact i i suppose not being a specialist in these issues of course but uh, that it's basically uh, maybe uh, easier to uh, match uh, something in the air than under the sea level and maybe also smaller countries have better equipment with uh, this uh, air monitoring than, mm -hmm. than the, the, the undersea monitoring. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, thank you so much. Uh